turn around, talk to the people around you. About probably four people is, is easiest. And try to come up with one or two ideas and we'll share those really quick. Wait. <laughs>
like actually making sure they fully understand the difference between for and since. Okay. The actual meanings of it. Right. Because if they don't know the difference, it doesn't matter. They don't know which one goes in which one. Right, right, right. I think, like, I think Dave said it, and like, spend time in making sure they understand it. Okay. And we talked about reviewing it beforehand. Right. right. Making sure that that's clear, the difference between the two. Yeah, sorry to add to the time Draw okay, good. So draw a line and if it's got this period of time, then it's this one. If it's just a dot in the past, then it's this one kind of thing. Okay, good. And we got another hand over here. Um, we're talking about doing an example with them, maybe the teachers, where the teacher has lived since and how they can do that. Okay, good. So showing them an example built in before having them try it to fill in the Alright, good. So you can actually use the teacher's own. Life, what do you call that? A lifeline? That's not lifeline. Teacher's own timeline. Time yeah. <laughs> teacher's own timeline? That doesn't sound right. Anyway, personal experience. Yeah, you use a teacher's own personal experience, their life kind of experience to, to talk about this. You guys are next, because I'll break it. Alright, so again, these are just kind of my ideas as I was looking through this. Um, at the end, I'll show you a lot more kind of gamey game-ish kind of stuff. Oh, as far as games go, I hate games. <laughs> My first year in Taiwan, I was in Zhanghua teaching uh, Bu Xiban and An Xiban, cram school and after school program. The boss at the school had been a Hess teacher trainer for like eight years. So he had his system that worked very well for him. And it was basically, teach them some words, give them a grammar pattern, everybody give you an example, play sticky ball, <laughs> or squeaky hammer, or jump on the car, or something else that I hated. <laughs> and what happened very quickly was, the students would walk into the classroom, teacher, are we gonna play a game today? <laughs> no, we're not gonna play a game today, shut up, sit down. <laughs> It got to the point where all they ever wanted to do was play the game. All they ever wanted to do was the squeaky hammer. The learning didn't matter, the English didn't matter, communication didn't matter, it just mattered, the teacher was going to play a game today. So for a very long time, I refused to play any games in any of my classes for years. Games like Sticky Ball and stuff like that, which I consider, sorry if you guys play Sticky Ball and Squeaky Hammer, but I consider them kind of meaningless meaningless games. Like, you're, the, you're not using the English for its intended purpose. You're using it to score points. And to me, that's just not fun as a teacher. Um, later on, after I kind of softened a little bit to the idea, I started to develop more things akin to what I call activities. I don't call them games. But like communication activities. So now I play lots of games, but they're more like card games or survey games or something like that where the kids are actually not card games like poker. Card games like, uh, can I borrow a pencil? And if you have the pencil card, you say, yes, here you go, and I say thank you. Games like that, where they're actually using, using English to accomplish something other than score points. So what we'll talk about at the beginning is more kind of, more on the activity side of activities. Um, then later on, I'll show you something a little bit closer, more akin to the game side of activities. But, whoop. Wrong button. Go back. That button. Okay. For this one, my idea was to do something with uh, time coding. So basically, you would print all the times on separate cards. So this one, you've got uh, 20 years, then you've got 2004, then you've got more than 10 years, then you have April. Okay. So you go through the article, you take out all of the times. Each one you put on a separate card, very easy to do. You make a table in Word. In each cell you put one time, print it out, chop it up. Right? Very easy to do. After you make the cards, you only use the ones with four or six. There are some in here that don't use four or six. Um, for example, six months. He's only six months old. That doesn't count. Um, but do not include four or six on the cards because that's what you're trying to teach. So my approach, instead of explaining to them, instead of reviewing with them the rules for foreign sense, 
I want them to figure out the rules for four and six through the activity. Then you have a worksheet, and one section is how long, and one section is when. So you basically have a table with two columns, right? How long and when. If you want to do it as a full class, everybody gets one card, you say this side of the room is how long, this side of the room is when. And the students have to physically move to one side of the classroom. Um, depending on student behavior, student self-discipline, your ability to manage the discipline in the classroom, everything else, it's always easier to start in small groups, usually three to five students, and then grow to bigger groups. But if you've got a really big class or you're really good at handling the discipline, then you can just start with the whole class. Right? Uh, students divide the words into the two sections. They have to do that by themselves. Um, they can ask the other students questions. They can discuss it. But the teacher does not tell them where to go. If there's a student and he doesn't know which side to go to, the teacher can ask, you know, can lead them to the answer, but doesn't actually give them the answer for it. Um, discuss which, seven, which section is represented for four and which one is since, and then you can also discuss why this one is for and why this one is since. Um, you collect all the materials, so nobody has any more cards, nobody has any more worksheets or anything else. Then they open their book and they complete it individually. After they're done doing the work themselves, then they compare it with whoever's sitting next to them or whoever else is finished at the same time. And then you would actually listen to the audio here to check. So again, at the end, it's not the teacher telling them the answer. It's them using their tools to find the answers for themselves. One of the reasons that I like to do, that I don't like to give my students the answers all the time, is if you can get your students to start to work together to figure out the, uh, the answer sounds like a bad term to use, but to figure out the answer together, to work together to discover you know, what they're supposed to be doing, then that's gonna make your life easier. It's gonna extend their learning beyond your classroom, and it's going to improve their general education career, education lifestyle. Right? So that's kind of how I would approach something like this, in a more interactive way. What's the biggest problem with my way? Yes, time. time. If time is a really, really big issue, there are certain ways that you can cut corners. For example, don't do the full class activity. Have them do it in groups, and then send it on there. They raise their hand when they're done. Teacher checks it, okay, do your worksheet, something like that, or do your, do your workbook. Another way to do it is, or another way to kind of approach it mentally, is if you're not required to teach every single section in the entire book. A lot of it is it's just repetitive practice for the students. So if you can convince whoever's in charge of the amount that you cover, that you'll do three quarters of the book, something like that, then you can spend more time teaching fewer sections better. You understand? Two ways you can approach it. You can rush through the entire book and do everything. Or you can do three quarters of the book, but do it really well. Right? So that just depends on your individual situation, which, which I'm not really uh, clear about. And it would take too long right now, we wouldn't be able to talk about it. Either. All right, so next one, push the wrong button again. Something bad is probably going to happen now. Okay. This is the next one, which is Hello, Professor. I not see you something ages. So ages would be four ages, right? So it's, hello professor, I have not seen you for ages. Complete the sentences. Can you see it in your book? Probably, probably not. Print out is too small. I think the first one is a dotted line and it says the PP form, and then the other one is a solid line and it's four more sentences. Okay. Uh, this one, well, I blank out of the house blank April. So I have not been out of the house since April. Same idea, and this is what I'm talking about, it's a lot of kind of repetition. Pretty much the same concept, but you have to do it again. For me, I would teach one really, really well, and then skip the second one. But, give me two minutes, talk about it. This side of the room, get ready. 
especially you, are watching you, watching you. It's very important for the teacher to walk around the room because some people won't participate unless you did it. All right, two minutes, go. Sorry, I just realized the the difference between this one and the previous one is this one you have to add the PP into it. The previous one was only four cents. This is PP and four cents. Individual sentences. 
So each sentence on here is a, a separate strip of paper. So again, it's for printing and, and cutting. But you include the foreign sense on the strips. Again, we've already done that. So you're just reviewing that kind of as you go along. Half the students get one sentence and half get one vocabulary. So you give them the answers. But you don't put the answers into the blanks. So half of the students, you guys, have a sentence with a blank in it. You guys have one word. Okay? Then, if it's an outlet of the teacher, keeps one of the vocabulary. But nobody can ask the teacher until everybody else is done. So that kid's going to be the last one. Whoever, whoever was unlucky enough to get paired with the teacher is going to be the last kid standing. Um, student A reads his or her students. Student B reads their vocabulary. So, in a whole class sense, this would be everybody stands up, everybody walks around, I read my sentence, you tell me your vocabulary. If it matches up, then yay. If it doesn't match up, then say, okay, thank you, bye-bye. And they go away, and then you find somebody else. If you want to do this in a small group, everybody in the group can have one vocabulary. One person draws a sentence and reads the sentence. Whoever has the vocabulary for that sentence fills in the blank. If nobody has a vocabulary for that sentence, then the next person draws a sentence, draws a draws a card, something like that. Okay, so you keep drawing cards and you have to work it out based on how many vocabulary, how many sentences, how many cards you would draw. I guess for this one, everybody would have, you would pass out all the vocabulary first. So in your hand, you might have four vocabulary words. Somebody reads a sentence, you have to find which vocabulary goes into that sentence. Um, if it's a match, they stand by the side, or they put it on the table as a match. Um, if it's not a match, then they keep looking. When everybody is done, they read the sentences. So imagine if you're in the classroom, Along the walls, you're going to have pairs of students standing together. You start with this side, they read their sentence together. So for example, I would say, hello, professor, I have not, or have not seen you for ages. Oh, no, four is already there. So, hello, professor, or hello, professor, I have not seen you for ages. If it's okay, you move on. If it's not okay, you say, oh, uh-oh, we, we, we have a problem here, you two come back in the middle. You read through everybody, so whoever is not correct comes and stands in the middle, and then they do another activity to try to find the correct one. Um, then you collect all the materials, then they do the workbook individually, and then you compare in pairs, excuse me, and listen to the CD to check their answers, okay? If you want to do stuff like this, again, time issues, preparation issues. But if you can work together with the other teachers teaching the same materials, you can share the preparation time together and you can actually share the physical materials. If you don't have class at exactly the same period, you can pass it to each other and save a lot of time. All right, and next one. This, I think most teachers are just going to read it over and keep going, right? But, I hate reading and direct teaching to my, to my own students. So, stuff like this, I always turn it into some kind of activity, something to do. So, oops, oops, go back. Ah, right. How would you teach this? Two minutes. Okay, discuss. How would you present this? Or should I just skip straight into it? How about I skip straight into it? What do you think? All right. So for this one, I would do something for organization. Print individual sentences on strips. And you don't have to do this completely separately, but you can, or you can do it as one big group. All right? Um, you blank out the PS and PP direct references, so you can white it out before you copy it, or you can type this up by yourself in Word. Um, each group gets one set of sentences, arranges them into the appropriate categories. So now you're just doing teamwork with one master worksheet, and then everybody's discussing where does the stuff go on the worksheet. And use a PPT to reveal the information as desired. So as you're reviewing it, you have this up on the board, which is the same thing with everything blanked like out. Then the students tell you one piece of information that goes on whatever side. 
And there are two ways that you can reveal. You can do it step by step, or if you have a smart board or you have a wireless mouse or whatever, and the students tell you this, then you can reveal that first. And then you can reveal this, and then you can reveal this. So there are two ways that you can do it. It doesn't have to be completely pre-programmed how it's revealed. PowerPoint is a very, very powerful program. It's an <laughs> awesome program. Most people don't know how to use it. For my classes, I write and animate stories completely in PowerPoint. Actually, I think I'm maybe able to show you one toward the end. But you can do entire animations like you see on Saturday morning cartoons. You can do that pretty much in PowerPoint. You can do amazing stuff in PowerPoint. Um, so you can do stuff like this. If you have a smart board, the kids really like coming up and participating and tapping on the smart board or something like that. Right? So that's, that's how I would do this, is the students would rearrange that information themselves. Then you can check it on this, then they can open the book, and then you can read it together as a class, something like that. So there, you, can, you can mix it up a lot with how you do it. All right, next one. Read the sentences. If the first sentence is true, do we know that the second sentence in brackets is also true, right? Yes or don't know, right? So basically, my father bought a car. He still has the car. I don't know. I bought the car when I was 16. I don't have that car. Do I have a car? Yes, I have a new car, right? So the, the idea is the difference between PP and PS, we're just gonna cut it all out, <laughs> is one of them is still happening now. One of them happened at a point in the past, so we don't know if it's still not now. Right? So my father has bought the car, he still has a car, yes. Right? This is a little bit different, so we're gonna discuss how you would do this, and then I'll give you my ideas for this. Right? It's gonna be a little bit different from the last ones. So, like two minutes. I need some new ideas for, for what we're doing. Is that big enough? That looks big enough. Oh, so just tell them 
If it's past tense, you don't know if it's still now. So it's still wrong. If it's present tense, so just tell them the answer and go through it, write it down. <laughs> tell, not tell them the answer, tell them the concept. And then they have to go down and write the answer. Okay? And anybody else? Nobody else? Okay, I'll go ahead and give you my idea. Again, I hate telling the students answers. I always try to get them to, to find out the answers themselves. So for this one, I'm going to do a survey. What is the survey? Everybody gets a sentence on the strip, but on the strip, basically the sentence is small, then you have three sections or two sections if you just want to do what they say in the directions. Um, yes, no, and I don't know. You can pick out no if you want. Then the students read their question to other students. So you would walk around the room, and I would say, what's the first one? My father bought a car. Then I would have to ask her, does he still have a car? If she says yes, I check yes, or I write her, do you guys have student numbers? Yeah. Right, so it's easier if you write the number, then you can remember who you've asked. If you don't have numbers, you can write down their names, but then that turns into a time issue again. So she can say, uh, my, let's see, my father bought a car. Does he still have a car? Don't know. So I check. Don't know. My father bought a car. Does he still have a car? Don't know. So I check. Don't know. I go around and I ask everybody. Some of the students might get it wrong. But if you have, what, 10 checks in yes and two checks in don't know, then you can kind of guess that it's going to be but yes, is that what I said before? Yeah, okay, so then you get to know that it's yes. So basically it gets the students talking to each other, communicating for, with each other, and also kind of checking one another's understanding of it. Then you can also turn that into a discussion. Who said, don't know? Why did you say, don't know? And then you can try to, try to uh, clarify their misunderstanding about the grammar. So it's not just about telling them what's correct, it's about understanding why they don't understand what is correct, and then trying to resolve that issue. Okay. Um, then they, again, you take everything back, they do the worksheet individually, and then you compare in pairs and check by PBT. And for PowerPoint for this one, very easy to do, just my father bought a car, does he still have a car? Whoever answers, and then you reveal the answer, don't know. Right. The next one, you read it, ask the question, answer is yes, very easy to do that all the way down. Okay, all right, next one, grammar, oh my god, more grammar, how about I just give you the answer, give you my idea for this one, so this one is basically, look at the underlying words, which one, which tense is each one, PS or PP in the breath case, right, so same idea again, the idea is that if you approach each one of these sections in a different way, the kids won't be bored in class. It's boring for us as teachers because we have to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Our job is to make the students feel like they're not doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. If you can come up with four, five, six different ways to approach each one of these. You can take those four, five, six ways and put them into a cycle. And once you get them into a cycle, yeah, you're doing the same thing for each unit that you did for the previous one, but that was two months ago. So the kids have already kind of gotten over the you know excitement of doing that. So now it's going to seem fresh. It's going to seem interesting again. So you don't have to come up with a brand new idea for everything you ever teach. You just need to come up with four or five ideas for everything that you ever teach, and you can start plugging new information into that. And if you get it again, if you get into groups, you can actually write out step by step, minute by minute, how to approach it, how to prepare it, how to do everything. Then when new teachers come in, you give them kind of the manifesto on how to teach this section of grammar, and then you don't have the the drag, by drag, I don't mean teaching new teachers is a drag. I mean, you don't have the, the reinvestment of time and energy of re-explaining everything to everybody over and over again. Right? 
So for this one, kind of cold breaking, and this is what we talked about before when you mentioned there are certain words that indicate if it's going to be for or if it's going to be since. What are those words? Can somebody over here say something? No? How do you know if it's going to be a PP or not? Okay. Okay, good. So one thing is if it, if it's a specific time, for example, two years ago or 2017, then it's gonna be since. How do you know if it's gonna be four? Different question, I'll rephrase the question. How do you know it's going to be a PP? There's one word that always indicates that it's going to be a PP. Hashem? Or that? Yeah, haven't has, basically, yeah? Oh, yeah. So basically, you have the students go through the previous material. Look, when is it a PP? When is it a PS? How do you know? Or what, what, is, what is the same about all of the words of one kind? So you basically walk them through trying to discover the rule for PPs by themselves. So they identify the code words that tell you what kind of grammar it is. Basically, does it have has or have before it? If it does, then you know it's going to be a PP. If it doesn't, then it's probably going to be a PS. In, in this grammar section, at least. So circle all those words in the previous material. You can actually ask them how many how many haves did you find? And then they can have a race to see who can who can find the most have or, or has references. Uh, it'll become obvious when they do that table that we looked at, the blue and white lines on it. And one side has have or has for every single one. The other side doesn't have any of those words. So circle those words in the new material, and this one. If you want to do this as a whole class activity, you can print this one side on A3, put that on the board, and the students can come and circle all of them on the board. They can take turns coming up and finding a has and circling it. And then take all that back, students do it individually, compare in small groups, and then you check on the board, or you check with PPT, or the student, or the teacher can just write it on the board. Okay? So again, try to get the students to be detectives, to investigate the issue for themselves, instead of just telling them, if it has, has, or have, it's a bad. <laughs> Present. Perfect sense. I don't teach grammar very often. So. Okay? So, again, yeah, have the students participate in their own learning as much as you possibly can. Next page. Four more sections of grammar. Huh? All right, for this one, I'll go through it as fast as I possibly can. I think we're all done with grammar by this point. You basically have a conversation, two people, and for this one, prepare a worksheet with all the codes. Again, it's more of just a review again. Arrange them randomly on the page. You have four over here, and since over here, and 2017 over here, and a month ago over here, and you just have all these different words all over the page. Then the students have to connect all the appropriate words. So for example, they would connect have, with has, with since, with that's for since 2017. Yeah, so since, then connect to 2017. So they're going to have these crazy shapes, or not crazy shapes, crazy snakes, I guess, all over their paper, connecting all the words that have that relationship that can be used together. All right? So it's just an interesting little activity for them to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you have boxes on the board to fill in, so they take the words that they have on the worksheet, they take turns to come up, write one under the four, or I guess you do a PS section and a PP section, or you do a four section and a sense section, something like that. So they take all the words from the worksheet, they organize them into two columns on the board, um, then you review as a class. You've already done this five times already, right? So there's not a whole lot of new stuff that you can kind of introduce, but um, then they, you erase that off of the board, they do it individually, compare and compare, review on the board again. Okay? So review on the board, but what I mean by that is number 
So if it's number two, it's either joined or I've joined. Okay, so then you write the correct answer. Or you can put this on the board and then circle it in PPT and make the circle appear and then they can know exactly what the circle. Like put verbs in brackets into the correct tense, past simple, or present perfect. Like running dictation, you didn't know what running dictation is. <clears throat> I have a couple nods, a couple people say it's not yet. Running dictation, it, it takes a bit of organization. How many teachers do you have in your classroom at any given time? For grammar, only one. What's that? For, for grammar class, only the homeroom teachers. <clears throat> oh, only the homeroom. So yeah, this is one. purely you guys over here? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. One dictation in her class. For our summer camp, we have five teachers in the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. We have one foreign teacher, two professional Taiwanese teachers, and two college student TAs who are there just to help out. So for our running, running dictation is awesome when you have five teachers in the classroom. 40 students. Yeah, 40 students. But five, five teachers, so it works out, eh? How many students do you guys have? Oh, okay, you can do it with one teacher then, eh? <laughs> If you wanted to do running dictation, you could actually discuss and do it during your combined class. And then you'll have two teachers in the classroom, which will make it a little bit easier. But with only 20 students in your class, <laughs> only 20 students. <laughs> no, with 20 students in your class, yeah, you can probably handle it just with one teacher. It shouldn't be too big of a problem. All right, what you do with that is, <clears throat> you create worksheets with only the names of the speakers. So here we have Mike Terry, Mike Terry, Sandy, Jasmine, Sandy, Jasmine, Marie, Julie. That's all you have on one side of the page. You have one master copy at the front of the room. So you print it out. You print out, basically copy this out of the book, put it in the front of the room. Right? You don't post it on the board. You set it on a desk. So the students can't see it when they're sitting down in their groups. And you make it as big as possible because two or three people are probably going to be looking at the same time. Um, <clears throat> in their groups, they take turns going to the front. Then one person finds the answer, sits down, tells the answer to their group. Their group writes it down, teacher checks it, next student goes and finds the next answer. Right? That's a very brief explanation of what's going to happen. Um, perform a running vacation until the whole worksheet is completed. And I'll show you here in a second exactly how to do that. Complete the workbook individually, compare and pairs, and check using PowerPoint. Okay? Have something extra, for example, a crossword puzzle or a reading selection or something like that for the, for the students who finish really quickly. Because there will be a time difference between the earliest finishers and the later finishers. Another way that you can do it, I have to take a break here in a second to clear my throat out. Yeah, water's not going to help it. Yeah. <laughs> um, another way you can do it is when the earliest finishers finish, time's up. Whatever's left for the students that aren't finished, you just provide those answers for them with a brief explanation of why. All right? Because at that point, everybody's already participated in the activity and everybody's already joined. Right, for the next one, all right, running vacation, this is what we do. First, you have four students in a group, you have one teacher. For in this example, the teacher is not a teacher. The teacher is a piece of paper on a desk. Okay? Student number one stands up. Student number one gives the first answer, answer empty-handed. So they go to the paper, they check the paper. They cannot take their pencil, they cannot take their workbook. Or their worksheet, sorry. Player number one goes and reports the answer to their group. Like, so they go over to their group, they tell everybody else the answer, they cannot write it out. They cannot write it on anybody else's sheet, they can't touch anything, they can't do anything other than speaking and listening. Everybody else writes the answer down. If player number one, or person number one, the runner, forgets the information, or if they, the other students don't know how to spell it, and person number one cannot remember how to spell it, they have to go back, recheck the original information, then come back and report again. 
Like, so the entire answer is reliant on this one person running and getting the information. So again, if they have a question, then that person has to go back, ask the teacher again, go back to the group, and then report it again. So this is what I was talking about when students have to hear something or get a piece of information, they have to retain it for a certain amount of time. That time from, I'm just, I'm not even breathing, I'm not fucking it down here. That time from them going to get the information and walk to their group, that's a sufficient amount of time for them to have to remember it and then to deliver it again. Okay? It completely changes the memory aspect of the, the activity. After everybody else is done, player one shoots lasers out of his eyes and kills everybody. <laughs> no, player number one uh, checks everybody's information. If everybody is okay, then everybody raises their hand and then the teacher will come over and check their information. After everybody is, has been checked, then player number one will sit down. After player number one sits down, then he or she can write down their own answer, but not until that point. After he writes it down and he's okay, then player number two will stand up and repeats the process, okay? So player number two goes, finds the information, reports the information, goes back and sits down. Then player number three, and I'm going to skip through this, we have time, player number four, and after all students have finished, begin again with student number one, okay? Showed me how to make something move, and I said, Wow, I can do so much with that. I just started playing with it. I, I did it all in Chinese on PowerPoint, which I didn't really understand. So I, I had to learn by clicking on every single thing in the program. So basically, if it were in English and I saw a word that I don't think I was going to do what I want, that I probably wouldn't have clicked on it and I wouldn't have known that function. So basically I've clicked on pretty much everything you can click on in PowerPoint as far as animation and drawing and all those kinds of things. So sorry. Yeah. I do do workshops on it if you guys are interested in something in the future. I do workshops for teaching how to do PowerPoint drawing and animation and doing triggers and all that kind of stuff. All right, so then what is this? Oh, this is the answer. So how, so Gene's a good friend of mine, how long have you no error, all right? So you go through and reveal the, the information. If you want, in the book, these aren't down there. So it's very easy to put your own words in the PowerPoint. Like, it takes literally like two seconds after you know how to do it. All right, next one, we have another kind of story. This is pretty much like the first one that we did. Um, put verbs and brackets in the correct sense, but it's verb instead of for a sense. For this one, I would do a listening dictation. Listening dictation is not what most people think of when, when I say listening dictation. I think most teachers, when they hear listening dictation, it's a test. I say a sentence, you have to write the sentence down. That's not what I do. All right. uh, for this one, you prepare a worksheet. The number of blanks on your worksheet is equal to the number of students in your largest class. So for you guys, you have what, 20 blanks? All right, so you have about 20 blanks on your day. You can go more than that, don't go fewer. And go through the steps, which are on the next slide, will be very, very clear after I go through that. Then you collect all those worksheets back, open your books, complete it, which they've already done, in one sense by listening. Now they're going to do it just by reading. Um, compare in pairs, then check on the PowerPoint. So for, excuse me, listening dictation, first, oh, this is for the arcane, so ignore that line. Right. When I do this, I meet my students tell themselves the directions. So for example, I say, we're going to listen to a, but it's not a song, it's a conversation, right? We're going to listen to a conversation. Basically, I'll, I'll say two or three words, then I'll do an action dance and tell me the next word. Why do I do that? <clears throat> Number one, my kids are very low level. So it gets them practicing very basic English. Number two, it helps them pay attention. If you say, we're going to, and nobody responds, you know that everybody's 
somewhere else, right? So I always do that to keep them interacting with me at every point possible. Also, while you're doing it, you can keep looking around and it's, it's much easier to pick out the kids who are not paying attention and then you can deal with that issue. There are lots of ways to deal with that issue, but that's a different workshop. Right? So uh, we will this in two times up. So every one of these has basically an action. Um, after we listen two times, everyone will stand up. You have to tell me one line or tell me one blank, tell me one word, whatever you want to do with that. Um, oh, why don't they say even if it's wrong? <clears throat> if the blank is supposed to be bird, and they say void, you write B-O-I-D. -E. You write void. Why do you do that? Number one, they need to understand that what their brain was thinking and what their mouth was saying were two different things. And if you just try to explain that to them, they'll say, okay, 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 next time they're going to say void. They're not going to change. But if you write void and they say, no, void, and then, yeah, void, no, void, no, void, yeah, void, 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 and then you keep going back to the <laughs> bird, and then you change it to bird, next time they're going to say bird. Right? Because it's, it's like biofeedback via the teacher kind of idea, okay? So right when they say, even if it's wrong, by the end of the lesson, you'll have all the correct answers on the board. But the process is more important than the correct answer. By doing this, kind of like what I mentioned before, they need to learn that number one, the teacher isn't the fountain of all answers and wisdom in the world. They need to know that other students can help provide answers for them or can help them get the correct answer. And they need to learn to start working together and taking responsibility for their own, for their own work. Okay? Uh, then you can sit down. When everyone's sitting down, we will read through, make sure everybody understands. We will read through the conversation. We will act it out. We will do whatever you want. And then you're done with your lesson. Okay? Um, and that's pretty much it. Any questions about this? Extremely effective, sounds boring, kids love it. Because everybody's standing up and everybody's raising their head and everybody's all, oh, and they can move around a little bit, they don't have to just sit and stock still the whole time. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Works with songs, works with conversations, works with stories, whatever you want to use it for. Okay. Um, next one two are correct, one is incorrect, false and out. Okay, for this categorizing, uh, basically, Put all of them, I think this one we did previously, very similar. Um, you put all these into a, put all the words onto separate cards, give them a worksheet with different categories on it. They have to put the words into the correct categories, check it, blah, 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 like, so let's get through this. Uh, next one, rewrite the sentences. This one is a little bit different. This one, you guys have an idea for this one, right? What can you do with this? Basically they have, we've known Mr. and Mrs. Parker for many years, you have to change it to met, so we met Mr. and Mrs. Parker many years ago. Yeah, it is. This one I know a lot of the foreign teachers at least probably have tried before. No? Study is pop to mind? What's that? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. I call it a sentence puzzle. Okay. So basically, each of the words is on a separate card. Then you have to put the words into words. Right? I know in America, at least, we have, like, you can buy things like this at the store. You buy a little box and it has, like, <coughs> a thousand English magnetic words. You put them all in your refrigerator and the kids rearrange the words into different sentences just for fun. Right? So you make each individual word is one card. It's better for this if you use the heavier paper. Otherwise, they'll blow away, or you can't pick them up, or something like that. Um, capitalization should stay the same, so they know where the sentence begins. Or you can take the capitalization on the first words of the sentence away, and it's a little bit more difficult for the kids for a challenge. Um, two ways you can do punctuation. You can put it on a separate card to make it harder, or you can attach it to the last word of the sentence. So for example, this, your card could be yesterday period, so they pick out all of the last words in the thing. They know exactly where the last word is just by the fact that it has a period on it. Or you can separate the period onto another card, and then they have to figure it out completely. 
you mix all of the words for each number together. So for example, number one, you would have two sentences mixed together. The reason you do that is they find we and weave. So they know that we and weave have to be in two separate sentences. Then when they find met and known, they have to try to figure out which grammar goes with known, which grammar goes with met. Okay? So it makes them think about pairing up the grammar together. Um, they work in pairs of small groups or rearrange them into sentences. The teacher checks them as they go through. If they're correct, the teacher collects them, gives them the next sentence. Right? So they're only doing one sentence at a time. The teacher has to check it before they get the second sentence. Um, if they're incorrect, you say, no, you got two words wrong. No, you got three words wrong. You don't tell them, no, this word is wrong. You tell them how many they have to try to figure it out. Um, repeat until they're correct. The last two sentences, so five and six, you give them basically four sentences together that are all mixed up. Because those students are already finishing more quickly, so you want to give them something that's going to be a little bit more difficult, so they spend a little bit more time doing that. Also, if they're finishing more quickly, their English is probably better. They need a, a harder challenge at the end, right? Because the, the first step is too easy for them. All right. This goes into a different book, right? Yes. This is your regular book. Vocabulary. How do you teach vocabulary? Yes. No, I thought you raised your hand. Oh. Oh, oh, I said, how do you teach vocabulary? Oh, oh, would you like to tell me how? Now that you've already raised your hand. I've got a thousand. You're just saying hi. No, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, okay, who teaches vocabulary? I'll start with that one. Actually, everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Four teachers and I would teach everybody teaches vocabulary. Okay, so one minute. Give me how many? Let's go back to four. Since we're not doing grammar anymore, right? Four ideas for teaching vocabulary, and then I'll share my ideas. Okay? So, talk amongst yourselves. Two minutes. Yeah, I'm 
obviously they're high level students and they can remember a whole sentence. And the, I, I do a lot of education with my English teachers. I teach English teachers at the university. Money education is one of their favorite activities. Before we get into this, we have one question. What level of student can you do this stuff with? Any level you want. I teach the I teach an English teacher certification course at National Education University, National Title University. Running dictation is one of the teacher's favorite activities to do. I also teach it to zero level third graders in our summer and winter camps. They love it. You don't have to, the good thing about a lot of these activities is you don't have to understand it at the beginning. For example, if the word is, I would call her review, they don't have to understand what review means at the beginning. They just find the word, go back and report to their group. If their group doesn't know how to spell it, the runner has to spell it for them. If the runner doesn't know how to spell it, the runner has to go and find out how to spell it, and then come back and tell them again. So he might say, R-E, Wanda, they say, oh. Go back, look at it, go ahead. R-E-V-I-E-W, R-E-V-I-E-W, right? By the end of the class, everybody will understand all of the words that they've reported and written down. But the process, of remembering it and delivering it and listening to one of your peers saying it instead of the teacher saying it and stuff like that. It makes the learning process very memorable, which is the key. So again, the key isn't necessarily just the answer. The key is the process, making that process real and meaningful for the students as they're doing it. Um, what other things? Listening dictation. Again, they don't have to understand bird. They just say it first, they hear it, they say what they hear, you write it down, whatever they say, which is confirmation for them, so which gives them you know, a bit of a confidence boost and everything else. Then, by the end of the class, they understand that that strange sound that they heard, and then they said, they connect it to a meaning, so then they're going to remember that for a much longer time than if the teacher had to say bird, B-I-R-D, bird and they write down B-I-R-D bird, right? So the process is, is key. Right, so for vocabulary, what do we do with vocabulary? Give us ideas, quick, 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 quick. Still so have lines and lines of stuff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pictures. Pictures, so so the flashcards, yeah. kind of idea. Okay, so run through the words, connect it to a picture, say the word, repeat after me. Okay, okay, good. So yes? Anyone. Anyone. <laughs> um, we have a lot of definitions. Okay. Where the kids don't really sometimes don't understand the words you use to define the word. Right. So yeah, I try and make sure the students understand all of that. So I'll put a word on board and then I'll just you know, give them the definition. Right. But one make them read it. So they get okay, okay. One slight step on top of that, if you do give them the words and the definitions, but they're both mixed up, then they have to figure out which one goes to which. Yeah. And then that will help them take the next step to start to understand some of the words, or to at least guess it some of the words, or know which words to skip, which words to pay attention to in the definitions. Um, do you have dictionaries in class? No, okay. There's a dictionary, it's called Oxford's 
basic learner's dictionary. Small dictionary, not very thick. Really, really simple definitions. It's an excellent, excellent resource for kids. Um, I used to use it for my low-level adult learners. It's an awesome book. It's Oxford, I think it's Oxford Basic English Dictionary, Oxford Basic Learners Dictionary. So, good book. Okay, right, good, thank you. Let's get one more, and then we'll run through some ideas, and then I'll show you some crazy, cool, powerful stuff. You already gave me one. Ah, you already gave me one. I need somebody else. I need somebody else. Yes. Translation. That's what I was expecting you to do. <laughs> and how would you do that? Would you like to refer to your reference? <laughs> no, so I'm trying to just tell them bird and help. Kind of idea. Is it a good idea? You all expect me to say no. I'm going to say sometimes. <laughs> Go ahead. So it's connected English and Chinese. Right, right, right. Yeah. How do you, you, you mine abstract? Yeah. There's no way to mine abstract. Yeah. Um, I would say sometimes because, number one, you don't want to rely on it. Number two, the teacher should not translate for the students. The students should translate for the class kind of idea. So when I'm telling stories or something like like my first story for first grade, zero level English learners, has the words wizard, castle, magic. Like it has these words that zero level English learners do not know. But I've got pictures on the board because the stories are illustrated and animated. And then there's always a student in the class who does know that word or who can guess what that word means. So the students will say it in Chinese. If it's correct, I say, yeah, it's very good. And then I keep going. Because now everybody knows. But it's not the teacher translating for them. So again, you're slowly convincing them that the teacher is not the only resource they have for learning. Other students in the class can help provide answers for them. Right? So translation, not necessarily a bad, a bad answer for this question. Yes, one more. Would you say that other students asking the question is more meaningful than the teacher answering the question for students? Yes. Just because it takes the teacher out of the learning equation a little bit more. I'm, which is not to say I'm, I'm very pro teacher-centered classrooms. I don't really like the idea of taking the teacher completely out of the equation. The teacher should, in my belief, be of course, more of a leadership role, more of an organizing role, not a direct teaching role. But to... But, so the teacher's role in the classroom is to keep everything organized and keep everything moving. But the more the teachers can learn, or more the students can learn from each other, the better. I think if you take the teacher too far outside the box, at least for my learners, because they're very low-level English learners, it just turns into what chatting and, and chaos, basically. Yeah. So the teacher's role is very important, but the more you can get the students to answer each other, the better. Because they're, they're, this, their classmates are their greatest resource. Because after your class, during break time, when they grow up, they're still going to know those people. They're still going to be hanging out with those people. They're not going to be hanging out with the teacher. Okay? Okay. Yes? Uh, body language. Okay, right, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you can avoid translation by using body language, then, then you can do it. Yeah. So body language mining is also very important. I cheat a lot because if I need a translation, I can do it myself. And I can do it very quickly. And then I can just move on. For a lot of the foreign teachers, if, if you haven't been here long enough or you haven't learned Chinese or anything like that, then things become a lot more difficult, a lot more complicated. So relying more, even if your Chinese is good, relying more on body language is still a good idea for them, for the students themselves, also for the other foreign teachers, because the teachers who don't have that uh, Chinese ability 
the students won't go into their class and say, oh, I'm not going to understand anything in this class kind of idea. Right? So you're helping one another if you try to rely more on things that everybody can do together. Okay? Whoops. Wrong button again. Alright, so these are some ideas. First one, silly sentences. So brainstorm, fill in, read, laugh, reveal. You take the um, the hyphenated words, you make a blank for them. You say, okay, everybody stand up, give me ten adjectives. You have ten adjectives, give me ten nouns. You write ten nouns, you do this all on the board. Then you take those, you plug them into these sentences. So maybe Carl smells the sweet. What's a random word for a noun? Carl smells the sweet car of flowers near his house. It doesn't make any sense, but when students kind of think about it, then it might become funny to them. For this one, it doesn't work really well for these particular sentences. So for this set of words, I probably wouldn't do it. So it depends on the, the set of sentences you have. I have something called a silly story, which I'll talk about here in a second, and that'll make a lot more sense. Right? My clicker at school has my button right here. Right, you do matching on the worksheet. Um, some will be funny, some will be a challenge. So you give them all the words, you give them all the sentences that have to match them to different ones. They might, if they make a mistake, they might say, uh, let's see, there's one I saw yesterday. Ah, here we go. So Katie is a flavorful dancer, something like that, okay? So they, if they make the wrong words and then they get to the end, they might have some left over that are, that are kind of funny or interesting. Um, if there's a phonemic connection that you can do, like rhyming sentences, these are really stupid sentences that they have in the textbooks. For example, Susie the silly snake slithers on. If, if the key phonemic element is the S sound, they can do that. If you give these to the students, I think they're completely useless. If the students try to make sentences like that for themselves, then it becomes much more interesting uh, activity than it is just a way to teach. Um, you can put their names in if possible. So you can say like uh, Daniel the Daniel the dodgy dragon. Oh, 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 oh. Wait, if you're key 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 phony is the D sound. Um, you can make senses using their names. So for aroma, Daniel has a nice aroma. <laughs> or I expect Sunny will get an A. I understand that your students will do very bad things with this idea. <laughs> so, it depends on your class. If you have students in your class, they're going to say, you know, I expect Sunny will be pregnant by the time she's 14. <laughs> you might not want to do this activity with, with that class of students. Um, you can do drawing for the different ones. So, going back to the flashcards, it's just showing them pictures for the words. You might have them actually draw pictures themselves for the words, for the ones that are easy to draw. Again, abstract is not going to be easy to draw, so it might be, you know, take too much time to, to do that. Um, students draw pictures for the words instead of the students. Then another thing you can do with that is they draw, everybody draws one or two words. You can put those all on the board, and then everybody has to try to guess which picture each one belongs to. So again, you're turning it into you know, a student interactive kind of activity. Pictionary is an option, but again, Pictionary takes a lot of time to do. Do you guys know Pictionary? You know the, the Americans at least know Pictionary, I don't know. No, Pictionary is basically one student goes to the board, you show them a word secretly, they have to draw that picture. Everybody else has to guess what they're drawing. It works all right with, for example, eight words because they only have eight words to choose from. So it would speed it up a little bit. If it could be anything in the world, then it takes forever. But if you only have eight choices, then you can usually guess it before too long. Yes? And matching opposites. Oh, okay, there you go. Yeah, to match the two things that are similar, match the two things that are completely different, something like that. Right? Good, so there are lots of activities that you can do with, with uh, vocabulary that aren't necessarily so, so boring. Um, another, I think you have two more here. So first is spelling relay. You line up in teams. I hate lining up in teams. It turns it into a game instead of an activity. But 
depending on your students, it might work. So you have two teams, three teams, four teams, whatever. Um, teacher says a word, so everybody hears the word. The front student goes to the board. They can only write one letter. The student behind them is the only other student who can help them. So you don't have the whole class screaming the whole time. Only one person in their line can help. And it has to be the next person in line. So the best students in the class won't dominate the entire activity. Um, if they finish writing the word the quickest, they can go back, get in the huddle, and write a sentence for the word. Um, and you can identify parts of speech as an adjective as a noun, depending on how much grammar you want the word into it. Give them basic sentence patterns, stuff like that. You can use a point system. Yay, you get one point for spelling the word correctly. You get another point for making a sentence with the word. I hate points. I never do points because it always turns it into winners and losers. The students who are the winners almost always are the students with the best English. Students who are the losers are almost always the students with the worst English. If the students with the worst English are always the losers, they're never going to want to learn English. So I hate winner-loser games. I always avoid winner-loser games. Um, what's it? Yeah. Sorry, a good way to do that is if you like collect points or something. Right. right at the end, you say they have five, they have four, then you let them throw a dice for each of those five. Okay. Tally those points, so then they could get end up winning. Okay, okay, okay. They get. So put a random randomizing element into the into the point system. Oh, yeah, good. All right, so there are different ways that you can work with points and stuff. Um, I've tried tickets before. Too much, too much of a hassle for me. I don't know. The my school at one point gave me thirty thousand NT. Said do whatever you want. So we went and bought a giant box full of little prize kind of toys, and we set up a store in our classroom. The store was a student-run store, so we'd have student helpers come, and you know, the students would have to say, "I want the airplane," and that's, the student behind the counter would say, "Oh, it's five tickets," so they get five tickets, they get the airplane. Um, There's an all right idea, but it, handing out the tickets all the time became a hassle, and then trying to organize who's going to run the store became a hassle. So. If you have enough resources and enough time, then great. But uh, otherwise, I just go with, you know, inspiration and you know, cheering them on and stuff like that. It seems to work as well as anything else. I got a fun random thing like uh, Chris. Um, uh, I give the students one point if they win. The DVD paper so just only get another point. Okay. So they get two, and then if they DVD again, they get three, four, five, and sometimes they get ten points. So oh, wow. anybody can win that game too. So. Okay. Yeah, there you go. All right. Good. So lots of different ideas that you can make some of. Um, next one, all right, this is our story. Do you guys, have they seen this book yet? Do you guys know this book yet? Yes. Uh, is it for next time? They never teach ESO3. That's what the start, start Okay, so this is called Nail Soup. It's basically, what is it? Rock? Stone Soup, I think, is the original version. So if somebody has a stone, he convinces somebody to give them carrots and celery and tomatoes and whatever, and they throw it all together. Okay, so this is a story. All right, this is where we have this silly story, which I'll show you one of these. I'm just going to go through this quickly because, yeah, we've only got 20 minutes left, and I still got lots of stuff that I want to show you. And the silly story, who knows Mad Libs? Americans will probably know Mad Libs. How many people have no idea what I'm talking about? Do you know Mad Libs? No? Like, Mad Libs is basically, you have a story, has lots of blanks. You have a separate sheet of paper that says adjective, noun, adjective, Verb, adjective, 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 noun, adjective, verb. You get random words from another person. You write those on the separate paper. You take that paper, then you read the story, and you put those words into the story. So the original story may be, Daniel is a very tall man. But tall is a blank. So give me an adjective, you say, stupid. So now it's Daniel is a very stupid man or Daniel is a very red man, or Daniel is a very enormous man. Whatever they say, that's what you put into the story. Right? For the silly story, in ESL, Mad Libs do not work. For your kids, maybe. For my kids, never. The idea of a Mad Lib is it's funny because it doesn't make sense. But for ESL kids, if it doesn't make sense, it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> they don't understand it, right? So that's the difference between a non-native speaker and a native speaker. So for ESL kids, you have to make it make sense 
first. After they understand how it makes sense, then you can make it not make sense, and it will be fun. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's the process. First, uh, okay, process is key. They have to understand the original story, the original article, the original whatever, before you do it. That's a silly story. Um, brainstorm vocabulary. You don't have to use whatever vocabulary they use. So they have like flavorful and aroma and stuff like that. You don't have to do blanks for those necessarily. Um, you listen to the story, and they complete the story through the listening dictation idea that I just told you before, right? So that's how they do it originally for you guys. Maybe you read the story, you just teach it however you would teach it normally. Um, then, after they're done with that, they take their original brainstorm words and put it into the story with links. So they understand what the story is supposed to say. He puts carrots into the soup. When they put their silly words into the story, now it says he puts dogs into the soup. They understand it's supposed to be carrots, so then when he puts dogs into the soup, it becomes funny. Or he puts airplanes into the soup, it doesn't make any sense at all. But now they understand that it, it's funny because it doesn't make sense. Okay? Uh, then you read, they can read their own. The thing about this is, after they do their silly stories, a lot of the students will want to read their stories. They'll want to share their you know, silly concoction with everybody else. So it's not pulling teeth, trying to get them to read. Now everybody wants to read. Um, it can be simplified. For example, this is way too long to make a silly story out of it. So you can just use this two or three paragraphs where he's making the soup. So now he's just putting funny stuff into his soup. That's it. Um, another game is card line. I brought a couple games today that you can consider too. Card line is this game here. Basically, what it is, this is the uh, Globe Trotter edition. They also have animals, they have dinosaurs, they have superheroes, they have lots of different kinds. You have to put the cards in order based on one trait. So, for example, for the animals, you can do it based on size or lifespan or something else. But anyway, basically you have all the animals. On one side, just a picture of the animal and his name. On the back, it has the three traits for the animals. When you, you put one card down first, then player number one says, oh, I say your first card is a dolphin. I have a duck. So I say a dolphin, or sorry, a duck is smaller than a dolphin. I turn it over to check to see if I'm right. Yay, a duck is smaller than a dolphin, no problem. The next person has a tiger shark. Is a tiger shark bigger or smaller than a dolphin? Is it bigger? I don't know. <laughs> tiger shark, but a tiger shark is not a huge shark. It's one of the smaller sharks. So it's probably about the same size as a dolphin. So you're guessing bigger. So he says a tiger shark is bigger than a dolphin. Turn it over, oh no, it's smaller than a dolphin. So you have to put that to the side. You can do something like that when you have a story. You make cards and on each card is one thing that happens in the story. So example, one card will say, uh, a man and his son were walking down the road. Another card will say, he put carrots into the soup. Another card will say, they met a man and a woman in front of a big house. The next one will say, they ate the soup. So you have this stack of cards with everything that happened in the story. You put one of them down, the student reads that one, then the next one, so say the first one is, uh, the boy told the man he was, the boy told his papa he was hungry. My card says, a man and his son were walking down the street. So I just say, a man and his son were walking down the street before the son told his papa he was hungry. And then I put that down, or I can turn it over and check it. You don't have to put the answers on the back for this one. They put their whole story together. They rearrange it as they need to at the very end, you check against the original story. Okay? So basically they make a story themselves, but they, they just have to put everything into order. Um, you write everything on the cards, then you put them in order based on how they happen. It can be done before the story, so they have to guess what is going to happen in the story. 
Then when you actually read the story, they'll understand it a lot better. Or you can read the story first and use it as a review. Do they remember exactly what happened in the story that they put it in order? Okay. Um, issue with this, again, time. But if that story is very important and the events that happen are very important, then it'd be a very good use of the time to do this kind of activity. Okay. Hey, speaking of this, I forgot I had games. If you do vocabulary, Scrabble Junior is really, really good. Seems like it'd be a boring game for ESL, works great. Because on one side of the board, they give you all the answers. So you make a Scrabble board that has all of the letters already on the board itself. The students have letters that match whatever letters are on the board, but they can only put down, the way that I play it, students have five letters in their hand. They can only play three of the letters. So there's a certain element of strategy for which letters you play, because you only get points if you complete a word, not for just putting down letters. So if you complete the word, you get a number of points based on how many letters are in that word. So there's a certain, you have to think about, okay, if this letter is only three, or if this word is only three letters, then I'm gonna wait until I have all three of those letters before I put it down. Or if it's a long word like dolphin, I wanna build dolphin up until there are about five letters left, then I'm gonna wait for somebody else to put down two more letters, and then I'll put down my three letters and I'll get a point. Right, so it's, it's a spelling game, but there's a certain amount of thinking beyond just memorizing how the word is spelled. Um, another one which goes into exactly what we're doing here, this game is called Dixit. You might have seen this, this is sold in Taiwan. Now in Taiwan, this is one of the most popular teaching games that, that's going around right now. Dixit is basically, in Chinese it's called it's called like uh, storytelling. So basically with this, you can play it by itself or you can make cards from your book. So you can give them pictures from your book that, that, are, that actually happen in the story. The speaker, the storyteller, has to say something about one of the cards in their hand. Everybody has, I think, five cards in their hand, something like that. You have to say it specific enough so someone will guess your card, but you have to say something, but it has to be abstract enough that at least one person will not guess your card. So I say something about my card, I put that card face down on the table. Everybody else chooses a card from their hand that cl most closely resembles what I said. Then, everybody puts that card down, you shuffle them up, turn them all over, everybody guesses which card is the storyteller's card. So it's all about listening and thinking and trying to read, read your classmates' kind of personality. Kind of, it's, it's an awesome game, really, really fun game. Yeah, everybody, you can check these out after. I'll pass it right now. Uh, I'm afraid stuff, if you, you want to hold it or not? Because it'll probably fall all over the place. Yeah. Okay, you have to. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so anyway, those are some other games that you can consider for that. This, very quickly, you have, this is pretty much the same in all the books, right? You've all seen something like this before. Oh, yeah. So for this, first categorization, you have, you have details that go down to a point of view. So you put all the details that you want them to identify. Instead of having them go into the story and identify, you give them the details, but they're all mixed together. So then they have to categorize each one of them into one point of view. So each point of view has three details that go with it. They have to decide which, which details go with which point of view. Um, you can also, hey, let's put them into order. No, sorry, that's for the, uh, that's for the card that I mean. that's not for that. Um, next one, they can write morals for the story, for, for nail soup. The moral is, I think the real moral is you're supposed to share, something like that. Yeah, you get more if you share. What would be another moral for the story? What's that? And do you know stone soup? Uh, stone soup, basically a guy has a rock but nothing to eat. So he asks somebody for a cup of water. Or for food, but the rich guy won't give him food. He just gives him a cup of water. So he says, oh, good, I can, make it. I can make stone soup. It's the greatest soup in the world. He puts his stone into the cup of water. 
And he convinces the guy that he wants, the other guy wants to try stone soup. So he says, oh, but I only have enough stone soup for myself. The guy's like, oh, I can give you more water if that's what you need to give you more water. So he puts more water into it and he's like, ah, oh, this is going to be really good. It'd be even better with some carrots. So the guy gives him a bunch of carrots and oh, this is going to be great. Oh, it'd be even better with some celery. So he keeps giving him stuff until the end everybody has something to eat. Right? The new one, lie if you're hungry. <laughs> All right. If you're hungry enough, lie to everybody until you get everything that you want, and then everybody can eat. Right? Something like that. You can make funny morals for the stories, basically. Right? Uh, you can also rewrite the ending. In the end, they'll eat. In this story, they'll die of tetanus because they eat rusty nails. Right? Something like that. So you can you can kind of twist up the story a little bit. And the last one is Max Vocab to the root word, which is basically this. Aromatic comes from aroma. Uh, amazement comes from amaze, or maybe maze. So basically, you can make a word sheet with these words and they have to match them. Right? Pretty basic, kind of straightforward stuff there. Okay, this is all PowerPoint stuff. And I'm just going to run through it real quick. But it's different ideas that you can use with PowerPoint or to approach various uh, different kinds of writing. This is all stuff I've taught before. All of the art, everything, I made in PowerPoint. 100% PowerPoint. Okay? Everything you can see here is 100% PowerPoint. So the word sheets are obviously word, but using PowerPoint pictures. And, right, this is basically the target learning is right here. Where's your mom? He's, or she's in the living room. Where are you? I'm in the yard. Right? That's basically what they're learning. Everybody in the class gets a, gets a card, or you can do it in small groups where uh, each group has a pack of cards. Each group has a stack of cards. Um, this is the back of the worksheet. So as they find the answers, they have to write where everybody is. So if I ask, where's your mom? Your card says, my dad is in the bathroom. You say, I don't know. Ask somebody else, where's your mom? He says, oh, she's in the living room. So in the living room right here, then I'm going to write mom. Okay, straightforward enough. Oh, sorry, this is the zoom in the back. So I'm going to write mom right here in the living room. This is the PowerPoint activity. You can do this before as a guessing game. You can do it after as a review, however you want to do it. Um, usually I have one student in the back ask the question to the student in the front. The student in the front has to answer. And then they point out you know, where they want to click. I click it for them. Or if you have a smart board or a smart projector, you, they can click it themselves. Basically, if I say, where is your dad? Somebody has to answer. Where's your dad? You guys got to guess. He's in the bathroom. He's in the bathroom. No, he's not in the bathroom. Where's your dad? He's in the kitchen. He's in the kitchen. <gasps> oh my god. Your dad is captured by a witch. The story leading up to this is today we all went to a haunted house. But after we went into the haunted house, everybody got scared and ran away all over the house. So now you have to go and find everybody in your family. So where are you? In the bathroom. No, you're not in the bathroom. In the living room. No, you're not in the living room. In the yard. No, you're not in the yard. Come on, guys. In the bedroom. In the bedroom. Yeah, you're in the pub. Yeah. No, you're in the kitchen. Or sorry, the dining room. The dining room, okay? If you have a student in the back, a student in the front, the student in the back has to speak loud enough for the student in the front to hear. Student in the front has to listen hard enough to hear. They have to understand enough to point. So this is all, you're checking uh, pronunciation, you're checking listening, you're checking all this stuff at the same time. Right? When you have everybody identify where they are, hey, where's your mom? Oh, she's in the yard. Then all the monsters pop out. Again, all of this art you can do with PowerPoint, 100%. Right? This is all possible to do with PowerPoint. Um, the next lesson, so that's the first week's lesson. The next lesson, you're going to first introduce the monsters because you're going to use this vocabulary. So you give them the worksheet again. Uh, this is the top where they label the rooms first. So you want to review living room, bathroom, bedroom, dining room because that's the target language. Then you introduce the grammar to them and you want to write down the names of the monsters because that's the new stuff you're teaching just for fun. Not necessarily the curriculum. What is that? 
Sausage. Everybody says sausage. It's not a sausage, but it's a It's a vampire. Is it a vampire? But it, what is it? It's a grim reaper. It's not the grim reaper, what is it? So as you're doing this, you're asking the students questions, and they're really answering using real interest to figure out what it is. And this is how you draw in PowerPoint. You draw everything a piece at a time. If you draw it in PowerPoint like this, then you can reveal it a piece at a time until it's complete. Then they write down which on their worksheet, and then you go to the next one. So, what is this? It's you. It's David after a couple beers. No, what is this? It's a zombie noise. So then you go through, he's got a brain inside, and it's a zombie, so they write it out. Okay, so you do this for each one of your monsters until you're done. The mummy really has all those bandages individually on him. You got a, a happy werewolf until he gets teeth and nose, and then you have an angry werewolf. Right? And in PowerPoint, like his eyes are just a circle and two holes. Always. Right? So it's all different shapes and stuff in PowerPoint. So now we're going to go to the house, but it's a haunted house. You guys are terrible, terrible people. Last week, we went to a haunted house. Your whole family got captured and you just left them there. You're lucky. I'm such a nice teacher. I'm going to take you back to the house and we're going to kill all of those monsters. So first, we have to find the monsters. See if you remember. Where was the witch? In the kitchen. Where was the ghost? In the living room. Where was the zombie? In the dining room. Where was the vampire? So again, you have a student at the front, a student at the back, and you're reviewing all the language again. But if they were paying attention the first time, then more or less they'll probably remember at least a few of them. So this part will go quickly. Right? So you got everybody here. Hey, if you have time, you can talk about why is the witch in the kitchen? She's hungry. She's hungry. But she's not eating. She's making, she's making some what kind of stew? She's making some magic potion. Oh, huh? So she's in there because why is the zombie in the dining room? He's hungry. He wants to eat brains. So you can talk about why these people are in the different places because they all have a reason for being there. The wolf is here because of the moon. The vampire is here because he wants to suck blood of the sleeping maiden or whatever. The mummy is here. Why is the mummy in the bathroom? Toilet paper. Toilet paper! Woo! <laughs> Why is the ghost in the living room? Because he's the only one that's not living. <laughs> that's the only reason I can come up with it from anywhere. <laughs> So then you turn to the back of your worksheet, which has this on it. So you have all the monsters and where they are, they write it down. Then you talk about how to kill the monsters. So how do you kill a vampire foreigner to be quiet? <laughs> garlic, but there's no garlic here. Silver bullet, fire, water, wooden stick, diary, hammer. Uh, vampire. Wooden steak. Wooden steak. Right. For Taiwanese people, they won't necessarily know all of these. For foreigners, it will be really easy for all but one or two. Right? How do you kill a werewolf? Silver bullet. How do you kill a zombie? Hammer. How do you kill a mummy? Fire. Because once you burn him, he's, he's, he's really dry, right? So he burns up really easily. These two are the two harder ones. Why is the witch water? They melt. How do we know they melt? Wizard of Oz. So, which is water. This is a reference all Westerners will understand. But Taiwanese people didn't grow up watching the Wizard of Oz, so it's something you have to explain to them. So you can have lots of cultural discussion and background and stuff like that. This is the hardest one. Why is the diary the ghost? Ghost writer. No, not ghost writer. Why are ghosts still here? They have unfinished 
business. <laughs> you have to find out why they're still here. So you read their diary when you can figure out what is holding them here and you can help them resolve that problem then they can do it. Okay? So there's lots of stuff that you can that you can work with this. Okay? This is my silly story. Can you give me five more minutes? Okay. Silly story, first you brainstorm and then you do a listening vacation with the story. Right? And then you match these two together. I will play you my story real quick. It's a day at the zoo. We are at the zoo today. Lots of different kinds of animals are here. There are six elephants. They are taking a bath in the river. There's dogs splashing the water. There are three snakes hiding in the grass. There are two pandas. They are eating bamboo in the forest. Somebody eating potato chips. Five monkeys are climbing in the trees. <laughs> right, so if you want to invest the, the time and everything, you can actually record the stories and put sound effects and everything into it yourself. After you do the recording, then you, they take the words that they brainstormed before, you put those here. So we are at the, they're going to say, but it's not zoo, you're a random place. Somebody's always going to have bathroom. Somebody's going to have a park, somebody's going to have a supermarket, everybody has a different answer, right? So we are, you circle at, you say in, so we are in the bathroom today. Lots of different kinds of animals in here. There are two million cockroaches. Whatever the kids wrote down without knowing what the story was about, that's what goes in here. So the cockroaches are taking a bath in the river. You have a river in your bathroom. Oh my god, your bathroom is huge! So there are four... Ants hiding in the grass. How do you know for it? So then you have, for some reason, the animals climbing in the trees is often elephants. I don't know why. Elephants always seem to be climbing in the trees. But anyway, there are three elephants, or sorry, three elephants are climbing in the trees. Something like that. So when you do the silly story after they understand the original story, it's really, really funny. I've had students refuse to go to lunch. I had to kick them out of the classroom physically 15 minutes into their lunch period because everybody wanted me to, to read their story for them. And these are zero level English learners. Everybody else is laughing and laughing and laughing and they want to know what their story says. So they go and hassle the teacher until the teacher agrees to read their story for them. So for the kids, especially lower level kids, they really, really like this because they're creating something themselves which they never were, ever, were able to do in English before. Right? This is a card game I mentioned before, the borrowing card game. First, oh, for this one, you uh, first we have to take out our cards. So you take out your cards and then you have to shuffle the cards. So this is all pre-programmed. They didn't match it. Yeah, the kids think it's pretty fun. Right? Then you go through, you deal the cards, you actually physically deal the cards, and the kids are whoa. Um, so first you read the directions, the kids understand the directions, you can have them write Chinese translation, whatever you want. Um, for every one, you make sure that they don't... Uh, uh, match. <laughs> right? So for each other, how may I borrow a pencil? You write down a pencil. A lot of times the kids say, may I borrow a pencil? You say, oh, you can't say may I borrow a pencil, you have to say may I borrow a pencil. So you're reviewing the grammar as you're going through. Why is it an eraser but a pencil? For book, I borrow not a book, not one book. Your book. Why is it your book? Because if we're in if we're in class and I say I borrow a pencil, you give me any pencil is okay, right? As long as you can write. But if we're in Chinese class and I say I borrow a book, they say sure. They give you their math book. It's not going to be very helpful, right? So I want your book, the one that you're looking at right now. So you can explain the meaning behind the grammar as you're doing this. Right? Um, asking somebody to borrow something. Red looks at her card. She has a 
pencil. She will say, oh, green, green, you know, borrow a pencil. Okay. So you go through all this. Then if it's a match, take the matching card. And then he says, here you go. Then uh, Yeah, it's go fish. It's go fish with borrow. Go fish is a very useful game with anything that's a yes, no question. Any yes, no questions can be, can be played with go fish. The difference between go fish is, in go fish you have a stack of cards in the middle. For this one, you pass out all the cards at the beginning, so there's no fishing pile. You could leave a fishing pile and say, you know, go buy one or go, go shopping or something like that if you wanted to. Right? So then they go around, you have to do that. But you also explain why is it so important to listen because if somebody cheats and you're not listening, you don't know if they're going to cheat, then everybody goes around. Um, you do paper, scissors, stone to, to start, but choose only one person. In, in Taiwan, whoever wins at paper, scissors, stone is one, two, three, four. It's a random pattern. In Western games, the standard is always rotate to the left. So you have to explain this explicitly to the kids and show them how to, how to do this at the beginning. Right, so then you go through, you put the worksheet up at the end. Roll number one, turn around. Now roll number one and roll number two are a group. My kids are always two, 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 two. So roll number one, three, turn around, and you have instant groups in your entire class. You have, it takes 10 seconds to get the kids into groups. Right, this is a game called Find It. I'm already over Find It. Yes. Right, this one first, review, bed, chair, table, floor. Right. Then you go into the room, they have to find these different things. Where's the ball? The ball is on the bed. No, it's not on the bed. So the ball is... You can turn them both off. Where's the car? The car is in the bed. Yes, the car is in the bed, so the car comes out. The ball is under the chair. Yeah, the ball is under the chair. The bird is in the box. If you click the wrong one, then X will pop up. Okay, so same idea. This is a map game where you have everything, all the cards show you two places. Uh, the place you leave and the place you arrive. So then this is the PowerPoint that goes with it. This is Sophia who's on fire because I was too lazy to draw something more, more uh, complicated than that. If you get the right answer, then she goes to that place, an arrow will appear. Um, if you click on the wrong place, the X will pop up. And the students this, they have to do the survey of their classmates first and find out all the right answers. When they get them all down, they write them all down. And then this is as a review at the end of the class. You can also play it as a review game if you wanted to do it that way. All right. Feeling survey. So everybody has this sheet. And it has the correct answers here. The back is open. So the back is a real survey. You go through explain. How this is all done. So he says, Green, how is Sophia? Go through, teach them the actual student names. Because in Taiwan, these are the most common names of 2015 or something like that in America. Um, in Taiwan, you have lots of Kevin and Andes, but you don't have so many Noahs. Noah, I think, is number one in the American baby names right now. But I've never met a Taiwanese kid named Noah. Oh, yeah. oh you have Noah here. Okay, there you go. Um, so then you teach them all these and what they each of them mean. So similar idea, but then different way of doing it. They write it down. In the end, when everybody asks everybody, then they raise their hand. If they're okay, then they go and talk to somebody else. And how it is, blah, blah, blah. Then it's your turn to actually ask your classmates how they really feel. Right? And last one, last one, last one. This has a picture behind it. They ask and answer a question. They get to guess a number. What is it? An owl, no, it's not an owl. It's a butterfly. Click on the heart and it reveals the picture. All right? A butterfly moth, yeah, it's a moth again. But you can do this with different ones. What is this? It's an owl or a bird. All right? So you choose pictures to purposely confuse them a little bit and then that's it. And thank you very much. Sorry, I'm going to have a prepare us for the lessons for the coming semester. I hope that they are useful. But there are two things I want to clarify here. For Chinese translation, uh, a lot of our foreign teachers are not just native speakers, they are also fluent in Chinese. And same as is ASL teacher. So I still prefer to uh, let you encourage a student, like top student or middle students, to do the translation. Uh, not to let them depend on you that they actually know both languages, because 
I don't like if they are some honor or level student that know that foreign teachers are also you know, over, uh, understand, also understand Chinese and they probably, probably will try to talk to you Chinese. I still prefer the classroom to be whole English. So you can let the top and middle students do that for you and also they will be proud of themselves they can actually help their classmates. Okay, and thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much for being here, and I'm sorry to late 10 minutes for a lunch break. Okay, right. thanks. <laughs> and I think we'll open for the next workshop for PowerPoint design. Some kind of feedback and yeah. do that for 10 exactly 10 I, days. I rarely get angry in my class, I rarely shout, I, I just, I'm super nice, I, I right. just give them a choice. And right. so 